Welcome back, everyone. John Moskis was a monk who was born probably in Damascus, sometime around the middle of the 6th century. He spent some time in a monastery near Bethlehem, but also traveled from Antioch to Egypt and beyond before going to Rome, where he probably died around 619. But he did leave us with a very important work for understanding the monasticism of his time and place, entitled The Spiritual Meadow. The meadow's transmission history is complex, but I'd like to share a story from it with you that likely takes us right back to the early 7th century, if not before. It's a long but interesting story with an expert narrator, so sit back and enjoy. There was a virtuous anchorite who called upon God, saying, Lord, make known to me what your judgments are. God allowed the idea to come to him to go visit an anchorite, who was settled not a few miles away, and sent an angel disguised as a monk, who met the elder and said to him, Where are you going, good elder? The elder said, To so-and-so, the anchorite. The angel, who was pretending to be a monk, said, I am going to see him too. We will travel together. When they had traveled the first day, they came to a place in which there dwelt a man who loved Christ. He received them as guests and put them up. Whilst they were eating, the man produced a silver dish. And when they had eaten, the angel took the dish and made it disappear into thin air. The elder was disturbed when he saw this. Then going out together, they traveled the next day and in due course encountered another man who loved Christ and monks in the place where he dwelt. Early next morning, he brought his son, the only child he had, to be blessed by them. The angel seized it by the throat and strangled it. The elder was flabbergasted, but he said not a word. The third day, they found a long, deserted dwelling. And as they were eating, the angel saw a wall about to collapse. Leaping up to safety, he began to take down the masonry and to rebuild it. The elder could bear it no longer. He swore at him, saying, Are you an angel? Are you a demon? Tell me what you are. The things you do are not the sort of things a man does. The angel said, What did I do? The elder said, Yesterday and the day before, those friends of Christ put us up. You not only made the first one's dish disappear, you also strangled the son of the other. And yet here, where we have found no rest, you stand doing the work of a laborer. Then the angel said to him, Listen, and I will tell you. The first man who received us is one who loves God and manages his possessions in a godly way. That dish was left to him as the inheritance of an unjust man. I made that dish disappear, you see, so that he would not lose the reward of his other good deeds on account of it. And now his record is clean. And the other man who made us his guests, he is virtuous. Had that small child lived, it would have grown up to be an instrument of Satan, so that the good works of his father would pass into oblivion. So I strangled him whilst he was tender to ensure the salvation of the father, and that his record remained unassailable before God. The elder said, And what about here? The angel said, The owner of this dwelling is a plague who seeks to harm many people. It grieves him that he cannot succeed in doing so. When his grandfather built this house, he put money into the masonry he was building. I restored the masonry, you see, so that he would not be able to harm those he intended to harm by means of the cash he would have found when the building collapsed. I deprived him of the means. Now go to your cell, for as the Holy Spirit says, your judgments are like the great deep, referring to Psalm 35. Having said this to him, the angel of God disappeared. Then the elder returned to his senses. He went back to his cell, glorifying God. But story time isn't over yet. You see, the Quran has a very similar account. So they, referring to Moses and his companion, both set out and continued on until, when they sailed in the ship, the companion made a hole in it. He said, Have you made a hole in it in order to drown its passengers? You have indeed done a dreadful thing. He said, Did I not say, Surely you will not be able to have patience with me? He said, Do not take me to task for what I forgot and do not burden me with hardship in my affair. So they both set out and continued on until, when they met a young boy, Moses' companion killed him. He said, Have you killed an innocent person, other than in retaliation for a person? Certainly you have done a terrible thing. He said, Did I not say to you, Surely you will not be able to have patience with me? He said, If I ask you about anything after this, do not keep me as a companion. You have had enough excuses from me. So they both set out and continued on until, when they came to the people of a town, they asked its people for food, but they refused to offer them hospitality. They both found in it a wall on the verge of collapse, and he set it up. He said, if you had wished, you could have indeed taken a reward for that. 
He said, this is the parting between me and you. Now I shall inform you about the interpretation of what you are not able to have patience with. As for the ship, it belonged to poor people working on the sea, and I wanted to damage it because behind them there was a king seizing every ship by force. As for the young boy, his parents were believers, and we feared that he would burden them both with insolent transgression and disbelief. We wanted their Lord to give them both in exchange one better than him in purity and closer to them in affection. As for the wallet belonged to two orphan boys in the city, and underneath it was a treasure belonging to them both, for their father had been a righteous man. Your Lord wanted them both to reach their maturity and bring forth their treasure as a mercy from your Lord. I did not do it on my own command. That is the interpretation of what you are not able to have patience with. The motifs of these stories are very similar. To the astonishment of the traveler, several puzzling actions are performed by a mysterious traveling companion, and the interpretations of these actions are withheld until later. Both of these stories include accounts of killing a would-be evil child and rebuilding a crumbling wall stuffed with cash. To put it bluntly, is the Quran borrowing again? This seems plausible since in the very same chapter we find lots of other borrowed material, such as the story of the seven sleepers of Ephesus, one of many of the Quran's retellings of the life of Adam and Eve, and of course, the Alexander legends. Also, notwithstanding its bizarre details, the story is much less at home in the Quran and much more fitting in a monastic setting like its original context in the spiritual meadow. That's because there it's part of a frequent motif of the virtues of extreme poverty. That's something much discussed in monastic settings. Thus, in her book about John Moskus, Brenda Llewellyn Eisen comments, In this interesting and slightly disquieting tale, money, material goods, and even life are denied individuals who might otherwise come to spiritual harm through their possession. A damaging and disturbing conclusion that one could draw from this tale is that those who have not might very well have not because they would come to harm if they had. Lastly, some may object that John Moskus began his career near Bethlehem and generally spent his time far north of where the Quran supposedly originated, so it couldn't have been borrowing. If that's your objection, see the video I'll put on the end screen that explains the Quran's puzzling reference to Mary as the sister of Aaron with reference to Christian liturgy from a church located near Bethlehem. What a coincidence. I think we're long past the Muslim apologetic talking points when it comes to the Quran's borrowing, and I at least await a more robust explanation for why the word of Allah borrowed so much from the words of men. So what do you think? Did the Quran borrow from John Moskus as it borrowed from so many others? Let me know what you think in the comments section. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.